No more on mute. What success looks like for CEOs in 2022. Puti Mahenyele Dabengwa has been the CEO of NASPA since 2019. She is involved in various youth development initiatives, including supporting students and mentoring young professionals. Jane Karuku is the Group Managing Director and CEO for East African Breweries Limited. She steers East and Central Africa's largest alcohol beverage business with iconic brands such as Tusker, Bell, Serengeti, Senator, Guinness and Johnny Walker. Well, as a prelude into the discussion, uh, we know that the uh, continent does need a new growth and leadership mindset to, to uh, counter some of the uh, challenges and the economic headwinds that have been experienced uh, throughout the pandemic uh, so far. But the question is, uh, what does this leadership uh, look like? What does success mean for the new female front runners that are driving the changes and reforms in Africa Inc. Is it money, is it philanthropy, a renewed commitment, or is it the communities in which they serve? Uh, or is it passion ideas, or perhaps even a cocktail and a combination of all of the above? Uh, I do have uh, Puti and Jane, of course, uh, joining me in on this conversation to discuss. Uh, ladies, uh, first of all, happy International Women's Day to the both of you. I'm very excited to be in your company this afternoon. Uh, Puti, I'd like to begin with you. It's the first time I get to engage you for a 2022, ma'am. And I just want to start off with uh, your thoughts on what this year might shape up to be. We're already three months into the new year and uh, some can argue that a lot has happened uh, so far. I don't know about you, but it already feels like this year is flying past. But just given what has happened so far, um, how are the events shaping up what 2022 will look like for you? Well, good morning. Very good morning to you, Fifi, and good morning to you, Jane, as well. It's really good to be here. Um, it's such a pleasure to be sharing this platform with both of you. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a very difficult time um, for, for, for all of us around the world and particularly for the people in the Ukraine. And my thoughts are with, the, with all the people that, that are affected by the events that are taking place in the Ukraine. I, you know, it's, it's such a difficult situation because we thought that we were in the recovery mode of COVID. And here we are now dealing with, with the, uh, the impact of, of what's happening now uh, between Russia and, and, and the Ukraine. And so you, you just keep wondering what's, what's next. Um, and, and so I guess the, the reality is that we always just have to be focused on just being able to move forward. Um, and, and be focused on the areas that we're responsible for and, and to do so whilst also contributing towards supporting those around us who are faced directly uh, with external difficulties that they never even prepared for. So, you know, it's, it, it's a very difficult time once again. Um, and, and I think what's important is that we're able to show support where it's required um, and for us to keep growing um, in the areas that we are responsible for. I mean, you mentioned that I mean, we were wondering at the stage what is next. I remember when the pandemic first started, uh, the catchphrase at the time was that, you know, we need to be prepared because the next crisis is, is around the corner. Uh, personally, I didn't uh, realize just, you know, how short that corner was from the uh, 2020 and 2021 corner. But nonetheless, you do mention the situation in the, the, the Ukraine and uh, as well as Russia. And uh, Jane, I'd just like to get your thoughts here because uh, now we're dealing with the your political tensions. We started the year off uh, dealing with uh, Omicron and the after effects that that brought about as a result of the uh, lockdowns and the travel bans on the continent. And even, I suppose, one can add to that uh, cocktail just concerns around price uh, pressures and inflation. I recall it's a conversation that you and I had last time we spoke on CNBC Africa. But Jane, just reflecting on what has transpired as we are about to wrap up the first half of 2022. Uh, how is that impacting your vision for what the rest of the year looks like? Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm very really happy to be with you ladies uh, this evening, or for me this afternoon. So I think we're just coming in time zones. It's afternoon, it's good morning for Puti, but we're in different time zones. But uh, fortunately, because of the technology, we are able to engage on one platform. So we just come from COVID and it was very, very tough for, 
for most of us. I mean, we lost people, we lost businesses. And uh, like you're saying, there's so many challenges as we go into this half cost pressures, uh, disruptions from global chains, war. All around us, there's not a lot of positive uh, stories. However, I think we are in Africa. And I think for a very long time, we live in a VUCA environment. So whether it's political tensions, uh, droughts, or COVID or other things, I think we, we've learned how to deal with it. It doesn't mean that it is easy, but it's always very, very hard. So when I look back at COVID, I think there are some things we've learned uh, which are going to help us get over the next crisis. And I'm sure there'll be another one after Ukraine, who knows? And I think one is how do we work in, in the organization from using technology, from working with flexi time, from the changing consumer, the changing customer, the changing regulation, especially in tax, as governments uh, want more money uh, to get to their coffers. So we've learned a lot of things. So as a team or as organizations, we, we've learned how to work better together, collaborate uh, better together to self-motivate. And I think these lessons will help us in the way we communicate, both to consumers and between ourselves, and also taking care of ourselves as, as people, because well-being has become very important, particularly on mental health. And then for families, I think we've discovered we do need to have both some lives. So most of us have to work at our other, other self-important things like family and friends. But at the end of the day, the numbers don't change. Organizations require us to meet promises to our stakeholders. The numbers, the targets, the growth expectations, the profitability, the shared prosperity across the whole chain uh, uh, has not changed. So as I look into the future after all these crises is that we do need to work better at sharing our prosperity with the communities where you thrive. You asked us, you asked me, is there a difference between are we going to work better with communities or with employees or consumers? And I think the answer is we are going to work with everyone across the chain. And I'm lucky to lead a business that has a very strong integrated value chain, right from a farmer to the consumer who enjoys our brands. And I think along that chain, we must ensure, or my role is to ensure that everybody is finding value in that, prosperity, in that prosperity that we are going to get. And are there challenges? Of course, there are challenges. There is serious cost inflation, so we have to keep pricing upwards, unfortunately, because we need to keep afloat and we need to give what is due to our shareholders and our stakeholders. I think we also need to keep using our assets properly. So. Uh, we have to be clever at marketing and innovation to make sure that we are giving consumers what they need, despite the crises. And I'm lucky, I work in a business whose purpose is to celebrate life every day, everywhere, despite whatever curveballs come our way. And I think I promise to give consumers across East Africa great brands where they can relieve some of this stress uh, for themselves. And I think lastly, uh, we have to think about what, what data we have to help us get through the crisis, both in terms of lessons from the past and predictive analytics into the future. But more importantly, how do we build sustainability even through this crisis? Uh, as EAPL, we're just going, we are just celebrating 100 years of existence since 1922. So I have, I have, and my team, we have great accountability and responsibility to set the business despite the challenges for success for the next 100 years. So I'm optimistic that we'll come through this. Ladies, I don't want to harbor too much on uh, the negative, but uh, I also want to be realistic because uncertainties are still exist in the global order. And Puti, just to your point on the conversation or the question in your head is how do we focus on moving forward? Uh, part of moving forward will uh, need to address some of the uh, inequalities that were spotlighted by the pandemic, right? Uh, made worse even, uh, the gender inequality, uh, financial and digital inequality, uh, unemployment, uh, especially amongst women and especially amongst young people. And even climate change, I suppose, it needs uh, uh, to be addressed in, in, in some of those areas, just given the fact that, I mean, it's important for us to have a healthy planet. As you reflect on some of the challenges that you're looking at right now within your respective boardrooms, uh, ladies, I'm just interested in what the most pressing challenge is for you. And Puti, just add it to that, how you're thinking of fixing it? Yeah, no, thank you, Fifi. So, so we, um, 
have a social impact program called NASPIS Labs, um, where we are proud to be opening doors for young people. Um, and as you know, in South Africa, uh, youth are really in a significant, significant challenging uh, position. Um, and we are also focused on women within that, that program. NASPIS Labs is giving priority to female candidates um, across uh, these opportunities. And 75% um, of the candidates that we have within NASPIS Labs um, are female. So what NASPIS Labs does is that it provides access to digital education uh, for young people and then places these young people in employment. And the, the people are placed in employment across corporates um, who are seeking people with digital uh, capability to be able to employ them in their different organizations. Um, to date, uh, NASPIS Labs has trained, uh, provided digital education to 2,169 young people, and we've created jobs for 1,515 young people in the tech sector. So I think, you know, addressing skills and education needs, particularly in among South Africa's youth, um, is something that is really, really critical. Um, and, you know, particularly given the fact that the economy um, is really opening up more um, from a digital perspective. And, you know, having said that, I think the digital economy itself um, creates game-changing opportunities for businesses and consumers alike in terms of access and opening up of opportunities for creating a far more inclusive economy. Um, and what we're seeing in terms of digital acceleration is the significant opportunities um, for growth prospects, and particularly in the emerging markets um, that we are in, um, and, and seeing the fast-tracked adoption to online business. Um, and we've seen this in the BRICS nations where we operate, um, and you, you see it today on the African continent um, where we have our home country, South Africa. Um, and you know, I think when you look at the expansion of artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, these are things that enable pro progress in addressing some of the societal needs uh, that, that we have in our environments. Um, and these range from a number of businesses. So through um, NASPIS Foundry, which is um, a, a fund, a, 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 an entity that is focused on providing access to capital, and we have access to 1.4 billion rand, um, which we invest in early stage um, internet businesses. And the businesses that we've invested in range from agri-tech businesses, um, which improve food security and food sovereignty, um, to online education, um, where primary and tertiary education um, or specific skills de development um, is done. Um, and, and, and so we, we continue to, to invest in a number of, of digital businesses, early stage digital businesses, and our focus, given the type of organization that we are, is our ability to help these businesses to scale. Um, and so when you look at a business, for example, um, I've spoken of Agritech um, and, and I've, I've, I've spoken, you know, what, what's happening there in terms of the business that we invested in. Um, and I've spoken of online education. But when you look at a business such as Sweep South, which is now scaled uh, beyond South Africa, and they are now in East Africa and in North Africa, um, th this is what we want to see founders of businesses being able to do, to be able to scale beyond just being in one particular country. And so, you know, these are the different ways in which we are helping and providing support to ensure that um, we can see local businesses, local young people um, being able to have access um, so that they can play a fruitful and meaningful role in society. I'm glad that you mentioned uh, Sweep South, Putsi, because uh, it is uh, one of the uh, businesses within your fold that is led by a woman. And I want to stick to this point now because uh, many people say the digital economy is the economy essentially, yet we've got a lot of women in the digital economy that are being left outside. And I'm interested just in your interactions, uh, perhaps even as NASPAS uh, Foundry, but as the NASPAS group as a whole, in your interactions with women in the digital space, with women in tech, what do you think is the reason why we don't have a lot more people in the space that look like you and me? I think it's, it, it really is access. It, it, it's women being able to have access 
to the opportunities that are available. Um, so whether it is access from an entrepreneurial perspective or access from a corporate perspective, um, and, and that is why we are really focused um, as, as NASPERS in ensuring that we are providing this access. I mean, if, if I look at, at the team of people that I work with, it's primarily women. Um, and, and, you know, the reality is, is that all we did was just to look for the best skills and they just happened to be women. Um, but, but the reality is that when, when you are looking for skills and, and you want to ensure that you have a diversified team, you have to have women there. Um, and, and, and so we, we have a very diversified team here in South Africa. Um, and, and I think also from an entrepreneurial perspective, it's important that you are you actually focus on ensuring that you can have uh, provide access to to female entrepreneurs. Um, it, it's it's you know it, it's it's not as if it's always um, uh, easily uh, done. So you know unless you have a focused approach on ensuring that you can create opportunities for women, that's that's the best way to do it. But the reality is, in terms of education, women are available. The the most educated people in South Africa are women, um, and and so it, it, it's really strange when the opportunities don't go mostly to women um, and, and and so from that perspective it's about us really opening up and, and really making opportunities available to the best people that are available in society um, and, and you'll find that predominantly it will be women. All right, so That's it's an intent. <laughs> it's uh, being intent about uh, increasing access to markets uh, for uh, women, particularly in the tech space. Jane, I want to circle back to inflation uh, with you. Uh, and I just recall our last conversation. I mean, I think we knew that inflation and price pressures were going to be a problem uh, for, for 2022. We knew that. Um, that towards the tail end of 2021. But then, uh, the past two weeks, uh, the tensions in Eastern Europe, it's just uh, seen commodity prices just fly through the roof. I mean, last I checked, wheat is scaling at uh, record highs. I don't even know what Hobbes prices are doing uh, presently. And the reason that, I, that I'm, 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 I'm harboring on this particular issue is, it is going to apply uh, pressure to businesses, perhaps even some of the smaller farmers or the smaller suppliers that feed into your value chain as East African breweries, perhaps even some of those uh, being owned by women. Uh, what, 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 what is the approach? How is the company uh, thinking about just stemming some of the uh, pressures that could uh, really hit the, these SMEs hard, particularly if this uh, current situation in uh, Eastern Europe is not contained? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and, yeah, and it's okay to go back to the cost inflation question. It's a real issue. So I think for us, like I said even last time, we do have a, a very integrated business. We have about 60,000 uh, farmers with suppliers and a whole host of other suppliers. So, and mostly of late, we've been trying to increase that, that ratio to women, uh, to be more women. Our target is to be 50-50. We're about 30% now to 35%. And one way we want to deal with that cost inflation, of course, money is to cut costs. So through COVID, we ran some very serious cost efficiency, um, uh, shall I say, programs within the organization so we can protect our margins. But obviously, also, there has to be a price equation in that because we cannot cover everything through cost um, efficiencies. So we do give contracts to all our suppliers, and uh, we've been changing their prices as well because we also want them to survive. Uh, like I said just a few minutes ago, our job in, where in the markets where we operate is to ensure that our integrated value chain is sustainable and with serious shared prosperity. And I'll give you examples. So we give contracts to our farmers and guaranteeing market, market access like you know in this part of the world is the most important. We also give capability training from either whether it's uh, how to do better uh, husbandry of your crops or or even giving you, we do research and give you better seeds. We also are training suppliers, other suppliers like agencies and biasing them towards women in terms of how they can do businesses right. And whether it's the, end or the other end of the business, which is our distributors and our customers, we are also supporting them a lot. And for example, we have, a, we, we, we announced a $5 million uh, fund to help buzz get back after closure, after the COVID effects. And then from a uh, progressive portrayal in advertising, we're really training uh, suppliers in advertising uh, or in directing even films 
um, giving them the right capability. For example, a few months ago, we brought one of the best from South Africa to train female director leads in East Africa so that we can get that capability here. And that also reduces cost for us, also guarantees a, a sort of market access to people who are around here. So I would say that uh, cost inflation is tough. Some of it will have to price out. Some of it will have to drive cost productivity, but others will have to contract. But I think the most important thing is that a few years ago, we declared an intent to have 80% of all our inputs sourced locally. And that kind of shields us from the heavy sort of shocks from global impacts, for example, what is going on in Ukraine. Obviously, some of it will come through, but I think that is also helping us. Uh, and then I think lastly is that uh, we've declared these things in the overall strategy. We've said inclusion and diversity across the chain, whether it's the kind of the kind of people who are in our contracts for farming, the kind of people who are giving us agencies in terms of advertising, the people who are in our advertising also are tending to be more women. Uh, and then lastly, we do um, spend 1% of our profits in East African Breweries Foundation, where then we go to things like water availability or water replenishment for the communities where, where, we, where we operate. So we have two ways, I guess, the integrated value chain end to end, plus specific funds that are 1%. I have to say in the case of youth, we don't deal with anybody above 18, 18, uh, below 18 years, but we do work very hard in terms of um, helping them, or even, let's say, below the 35 years, on educating them on positive drinking so that they are not missed uh, by alcohol. That's our responsibility. So I hope I've answered you, cost inflation you have. will be a challenge. <laughs> but we are really going back to very hard to make sure that we are that we can deal with our reality and not yeah. really collapse and see ourselves for the future. Yeah, and of course, dealing with anyone below the age of 18 would be very irresponsible. But Jane, I want to stick to uh, stick with you and just to speak about the opportunity that is agriculture, right? Because the continent has hectares and hectares of arable land. We all need to eat. Uh, big opportunities in uh, the space to drive shared prosperity. Yet I do understand that even in the agricultural sector, the uh, level of female representation uh, is questionable and there is much that also can be done to improve. So just given uh, your targeted intent to uh, increase and bring more um, local input, local manufacturing as part of your value chain. What is your message for some of the women who are in the space, who are joining us virtually at the summit, as to how they can also uh, be on board in winning a contract from yourselves? Yeah, so that's a great question. So already I must say that the majority of farmers are women. Okay, the guys who do the hard work. The economic contract owners may be different you understand, coming from an African context. So the, the men sometimes own the contracts. But what we are trying to do is to make sure that the people who are doing the real work have the contracts. And we have a lot of uh, our employees working out there to source for these contracts and help the women even know how to write a contract and how to honor a contract. Because sometimes writing, honoring are two different things. So there's a lot of education we are taking, we're using partners. Uh, and not just uh, diversity from a women perspective, we are now into people living with disabilities and we are work, working with other partners, for example, site savers, because we don't know how to deal with that kind of diverse group. And they are helping us make sure that we are doing the right things for prosperity and, and also for right, right things for everybody, including us and, and themselves. So if you're a woman and you have land and you know what we need, we need Bali and Sogam. We also have other sorts of uh, requirements within the business. Just go to our website, check what we require. Recently, we, we advertise for suppliers, for agencies, means advertising materials, and we intentionally and deliberately selected women-owned businesses. And we have a target. We've called it out in our strategy. We want to be 50-50 by 2030. We are now in the 30s. Uh, we are not happy where we are, but as a leader in the business, I do have that target. 
as part of my performance objective. So we are driving this very, very hard and including oh. all the leadership within the business. All right, we'll be monitoring that and uh, holding you accountable for meeting uh, that target, ma'am. Ladies, as we uh, take this conversation to the uh, finish line, perhaps a uh, deeper reflection on what we're here to discuss. We're resetting, we're reconfiguring, and uh, we are uh, recharting and rethinking, rather, a new leadership that is needed for this new world order. And I'd like to get your thoughts on that, on, uh, I mean, Puti, as uh, you reflected on the theme, this, this new kind of leader, this new kind of mindset, what resonated with you? Uh, the, what kind of leader do we need to work towards here? Well, the, the theme for International Women's Day is break the bias. And, and I think that's exactly what, what is required here. Um, it, it, it's for us to move away from looking for the same type of leader who approaches things in the same way, but rather to be a lot more inclusive in looking for a leader who is willing to engage with different parties in order to come to the solutions that, that are required. Um, and, and when you look at in, around the world, um, in, in countries that are led by women, and you see how through COVID, um, it, it was these countries that are led by women that were able to come to solutions in dealing with COVID. Um, it, it just shows you just what we miss when we don't um, foresee the opportunity that lies in making sure that we have more women and that we are breaking the bias of working against women. All right. And for you, Jane, uh, what does the uh, new leader in this uh a new world order uh, look like? Because I would argue on uh, one hand that we have seen a bit of breaking of biases. We've seen a, a lot of advancements, uh, Puti, I don't know if uh, you'll agree with me here, of women um, in uh, South Africa, uh, top uh, companies on the JC, particularly in the mining space where we saw uh, quite a number of new appointments there. Uh, we also saw in this, or throughout this pandemic, uh, quite a number of um, women being uh, appointed as the uh, right hand leader ladies, as it were, of, of these CEOs uh, occupying uh, CFO positions. I mean, the CEO, uh, the CFO of Telcom, uh, Tulufela Molefe, comes to mind. But yet still with that progress, we're looking at a situation where only 25% of women in Africa uh, sit in the boardroom. So, Jane, a new leadership in a new world order, how would you sum that up? Yes, so I think uh, I think it's true to say we are making progress. Is it fast enough as you would like? No. And therefore, I think you're questioning great. It's great in that the, the new leadership that is required is that which is different. That leaders who are looking for diversity, diverse opinions, and bringing different people to the table. Leaders who are looking to change the representation of who they work with uh, at source, at quality at loosely at source. And leaders who are fair, who drive equitable sort of dealings with people who are authentic and they really are deliberate in terms of how they deliver that agenda. And I think to, to the point of COVID, uh, the things that made us survive through COVID was uh, resilience. And if I think about the characteristics uh, of what is resilience, resilience is about getting, making a comeback or coming back or being able to recover quickly. And if you look at the characteristics that are needed for quick recovery from, from I guess, the challenges we have, women do have this. And I think about the competence, I'll call them the seven Cs, competence, confidence, character, contribution, coping, and control. Because in life, we do so many things as a woman. So kind of resilience comes to nature of ourselves, of our being. So I think the new leader needs to make sure that we have enough women representing leadership within organizations. So you can start having some of these uh, collective characteristics within the teams. And right. secondly, I think we have no choice Thank you very much. Right. No, thank you. Uh, you. Sometimes I think that women are just uh, a bit too or expected to be a bit too resilient, uh, resilient, uh, resilient in our personal lives and resilient in our professional lives. And maybe sometimes you don't want to be that strong. But uh, that's a story for another day. Ladies, we're left with two more minutes for this uh, conversation. And therefore, um, we don't have much time. But parting words as a formidable and respected uh, woman in business. Uh, just your parting words for some of the female viewers who are tuned in and 
advice on how they can emulate the kind of success you both have achieved so far? Puti? I would say that one of the things that, that I certainly have learned uh, throughout my career is just the importance of being able to just keep moving forward. I think um, what you find um, as a professional is that you face challenges, big and small, um, throughout your career. And it's not because, um, you know, of, of any other reason, but the fact that, you know, quite frankly, as a woman professional, you will face a lot more challenges uh, than, than your male counterparts. Um, and, and, and so having that resilience to be able to push through um, regardless of that and, and keep focused um, and, and, and also to have access to people who are able to provide you with support um, as you go through the different changes um, and challenges that you face as, as you're growing um, as, as a professional. All right. Thanks so much, ma'am. And uh, Jane? Yeah, I think to the women listening, I think the first thing is that nobody owes us, even as we are talking about diversity and inclusion. So we have to step forward. We have to raise our hand that we need to do the job. And therefore, we need to make sure that we are both functionally as well as behaviorally competent to be given that responsibility or that accountability. And like my friend said, make sure that you surround yourself with a good cheerleading squad, which could be your support structure, your mentor, your coach, and sometimes even the place or the organization where you work matters, because it might not be, in some organizations it's not too hard to succeed, others the biases could be too big. And then I think lastly, be a good role model for those who do not have a voice where you have a voice. Nothing further to add there. I uh, thank you so much uh, to you, Jane, as well as uh, Puti for uh, leading us in uh, the uh, conversation at uh, the 2022 uh, Leading Women Summit. Uh, my key takeaways, you keep moving forward, you push through it all, you stay resilient, you stay strong. And no one owes you, no one owes you do what needs to be done, but uh, certainly know that there is uh, power in a team and in collaboration.